Thank you, Josie. All of you should know that this man here is one of my most treasured friends and that uh, it's an honor for me to be introduced by you and to be here before this distinguished group. This is a, you had a very unusual uh, talk that we don't hear very often about uh, the right to die. And this again will be a very unique talk. In fact, this is probably the only talk that you've ever attended in which you are the patient. So we're going to talk about physician health, you and me, and the importance of personal wellness, and by recognizing the syndrome to avoid the adverse consequences, which can not only be devastating for each of us personally if it happens, but also can adversely affect the quality of patient care that we give. Now, I'm going to have to make an assumption because I have no data in Israel, but in the United States and many other countries where it's been studied, it's probably true that everyone in this room will experience burnout. Either you have had it or will have it. You will have a colleague or a friend or family that will have it. And it is inherent, I think, to our job and the selection of those of us who are conscientious, dedicated, and be perfect, if you're like me, that draws us into medicine and also among our medical colleagues uh, work very hard and are dedicated to succeed and to become a leader. And I'll start out with just a few uh, vignettes, very briefly, about some tragedies that are a result of burnout. A very uh, well-known colleague that I've written uh, many papers about, one of the most prolific reconstructive surgical oncologists at MD Anderson. Even though we thought that this person was doing very well, in his view he wasn't perfect enough. And on a Sunday morning, he went upstairs to the bathroom, put a gun to his head, and in a very promising part of his career took his life. Another very prominent uh, breast surgeon who will go unknown at another institution had to have an intervention at 10 a.m. because the nurses felt she could not finish her operation because of inebriation. Another individual who was the chief of trauma service at a uh, famous academic center in New the state of New York was counseled by his chair because he'd uh, had 22,000 RVUs in the previous year. He'd been divorced twice. He literally lived in the hospital, and his chair thought that he ought to slow down a bit. Two weeks later, he called his live-in girlfriend to the hospital, shot her dead in the hospital, ran out, and then committed suicide. Another colleague, and this is the last one, I don't want to depress you, but, but a, a very prominent chief of trauma surgery at Swedish Hospital, and he tells the story, his name is Mick Arashkovich, and he'll be in my story later on, was a very well-known trauma surgeon. He uh, got on the wagon with alcohol, lost his credentials and his license, and reinvented himself while he was in rehabilitation in psychiatry and became uh, skilled and now runs one of the largest physician rehabilitation programs in the United States and is the only member of the Co American College of Surgeons and is a board certified psychiatrist specializing in physician addiction. So if you remember these stories, this will make sense as I get into the general description, but I wanted to personalize it because these are things that nobody anticipated. Uh, and I would tell you, I've been through a burnout experience. I didn't purpose to go there. Fortunately, I had friends, families, and mentors that got me through that. Uh, I didn't recognize it at the time. So the point is that even if we do experience it, the primary message is to avoid the adverse consequences that can affect our careers or affect the patients that we treat. Now, what is burnout? Described in 1974 by Freudenberger as physical or mental collapse caused by overwork or stress. 
And it's a syndrome that many individuals under constant pressure or stress over a long period of time. Now, I want to tell you parenthetically, when we first published our papers about this, our internal medicine friends, oh, those poor surgeons, they work too hard. Until the studies were done through the AMA of internists, and guess what? They are the same as us. So what I'm describing to you is not unique to surgeons, but probably is endemic to uh, the medical field and some other specialties. Uh, burnout is characterized by some combination of emotional exhaustion, physical exhaustion, depersonalization, treating patients and coworkers as impersonal objects, which is uncharacteristic for us uh, when we're in our top shape. A decreased sense of personal accomplishments, that's the be perfect person like me, you keep setting the bar harder, higher, and even though you've gotten to a high level, if you can't get over that high level, somehow in your mind you failed. And you have a hard time handling, uh, dealing with what is inherently an imperfect world. So there are two sides of stress. One is over-engagement when emotions are overreactive, and the demeanor is one of anxiety or hyperactivity. That was me when I went through my burnout experience. And that's harder to pick up among peoples. It's an extension of us if we already started out with that kind of personality or demeanor. What's easier to recognize is the opposite of that with disengagement when emotions are blunted, when the demeanor is depression, detachment, helplessness, or hopelessness. But it's important to understand that when we use the word burnout, we're talking about both sides of the curve coin that could manifest in two uh, seemingly opposite different ways. Now, <clears throat> 40 years ago, there was only one publication on this subject. And as you could see, that over the years, as people have begun to study this uh, as a, a validated condition, that the number of publications have increased. We published our first paper about uh, eight years ago, when it was still un uh, very uh, understudied, especially in surgery, and as you can see, last year there were 725 publications just about this subject. Is this endemic to the United States? Is it only the United States where there is stress? Well, no. If, again, you look at where these publications are coming from, while they do come largely from the United States, these studies come from 31 different countries around the world. And in fact, the hypothesis most people study when they do this is, we're not the same as those American surgeons under stress. We're going to prove that we are happier physicians. And guess what? They find out that their rate of burnout with validated survey instruments are the same or, in some cases, even more severe. And as I mentioned, this is not endemic to surgeons. These are all the professions and specialties for which burnout has been identified uh, in the healthcare profession. So, burnout is important to distinguish from depression. Depression is a global emotional state that affects people not only at their work, but in their personal lives as well. Whereas people who are experiencing burnout, which is endemic to their work, may have a normal affect and not have um, depression when they go home and when they're off their job. Now, it's enough to talk about this subject because it's important for our profession, but part of the message where I think we got so much traction is the strong association, which I'll show you in a minute, of burnout with the quality of patient care that we deliver. We deliver. So being proactive as opposed to reactive. So all of those examples I gave you were circumstances that were reactive. Those circumstances where people took their lives unsettled the entire medical center for months and months after that, that one event. So it's important to be proactive, both for us individually and in the workplace environment where we work, both for the individual surgeon, and as I'll show you with the data, younger surgeons and women surgeons are relatively at higher risk. For those in certain subspecialties are at higher risk than in others. It's endemic to the selection that drove them into a, a certain specialty and also the workplace environment and the patients they care for. It's important for the quality of patient care 
and it's important to prevent or mitigate the extreme consequences of distress. And I've listed those on this slide. Many of these are a direct consequence of uh, burnout or vice versa. There are sometimes these circumstances can lead to burnout. So remember when I show you these results, we're talking about associations of what is really a bi-directional relationship of some of these conditions lead to burnout and in other circumstances, burnout leads to uh, some of these circumstances as shown here. So one of the tragic paradoxes that I tried to tell you in those uh, few vignettes is those most susceptible appear to be the most dedicated, conscientious, responsible, and motivated individuals among our profession. Those individuals whose traits are often idealistic and perfectionistic that can lead them to submerse themselves in their work and devote themselves to it until they have emotionally nothing left to give. Thus, the commitment to patients, attention to detail, recognizing the responsibilities associated with patient trust, the very traits that define a good surgeon also place us at greater risk for burnout. Now, this is also usually a multifactorial thing. It's not one thing. It's when the combination of some of these events occur in our life for which uh, we may take shortcuts to handle stresses that may occur, and that those uh, putting Band-Aids on the issues instead of addressing them directly over time uh, can lead to a burnout experience. The other part that is very clear in survey after survey is that we as surgeons do not do a very good job of taking care of our own health. We don't do, in general, the very things we tell our patients to do as part of their good health. So in this, I picked one example uh, of graduates of the University of Wisconsin who were surveyed after they left practice. And I thought it was very unsettling that um, Despite high job satisfaction, surgeon health, emotional or physical, was compromised in up to 50% or uh, by age 50 or less, with 20% of them having voluntary or involuntary retirement uh, prematurely. And notably, the length of a career in surgery was determined by post-residency factors, including major health issues, preventative health patterns, and exercise alcohol use and dependency, which I will come back to, family life, usually divorces, and a lack of uh, practice satisfaction. So in addition to those things that affect us personally, it's very important for those of us caring for patients in the hospital, where we have uh, committees on patient safety and quality of care. We talk about the importance of washing our hands I will propose to you that the status of physician health is also an important issue on patient safety and quality of care because these can be the professional consequences of physicians, surgeons, including our best surgeons, when they go into a period of extreme burnout. And there is study after study that has shown that approximately 15% of all physicians, including surgeons, will be impaired at some time in their career and unable to meet their professional responsibility, usually because of mental illness, usually depression, alcoholism, or very infrequently drug dependency. So with that as a background, uh, colleagues and I through the uh, American College of Surgeons Committee on Physician Health and Competency proposed and had approved through the Board of Regents to commission the Mayo Clinic, uh, who is the world's most experienced in doing these surveys of physicians, uh, to do a study of the members of the American College of Surgeons. And then uh, several of us from Johns Hopkins, where I was, including Julie Freischling, who's their chair, who later became a chair of the Board of Regents of the college, and when we set out to do this in our budget, uh, we had to pay a licensing fee for the Maslick Burnout Survey of 50 cents, and we budgeted 2,000 
which we thought would be the maximum response that we would get, and if so, would be the largest survey that had ever been conducted of physicians of any specialty. And um, this is the list of the uh, standardized or validated survey questions. There were 61 questions in this first survey. It takes approximately 45 minutes to complete. And we were blown away by a response that almost 8,000 surgeons responded to the survey. More than at any time in the history of doing these validated surveys on the subject, which is itself a statement that physicians, both academic and community physicians in the United States, thought this was an important enough subject to respond to this survey. So as you can see, they, we did this survey first in 2008. We published much of the results. It received a lot of traction, but there were still doubters that this survey might have been an aberration. So the College of Surgeons commissioned us to do a second survey in 2010, which, for which we had another 7,000 responses. And it might not surprise you, we got more or less the same answers. So this was our first paper that was published. This is actually for the year of publication in the top 1% of cited articles in medical publication world. And these are the results from that first paper. First, we were really surprised about the incidence. 40% of respondents fit the criteria for burnout. 30% screen positive for depression. Now these are screening tools that lead a primary care physician or someone doing the survey to send them to a for full-blown psychiatric evaluation. And approximately 50% of people who screen positive will carry the diagnosis of a major depression after full psychiatric evaluation. 28% had a mental quality of life score that was clinically and statistically below the norm. And this next issue is something, again, we've written about that really uh, bothered us, that 15% of this very large sample size checked the box that at some time they had thought about taking their life. And in fact, one in 16 had checked the box that they had thought about taking their life in the previous 12 months. So this issue of uh, suicide ideation and actually suicide is something that is very important that uh, you usually don't hear about because uh, the cause of death is usually not uh, stated. So this was one of our early papers also correlating burnout with medical errors. <clears throat> and what we found as there was the uh, surgeons uh, check the box, have you made a medical error? So these are self-reported in the minds of the respondent a major medical error. What happened whether it went to M&M conference or the magnitude of that, we don't know. All we know is that surgeon felt like he or she had made a medical, major medical error in the past three months. And of those who responded yes, we had a continued algorithmic uh, a series of questions about the reasons for that in their view. And for the first time ever, one of the major contributing factors in a medical error was the degree of stress or burnout. And in fact, in a multifactorial analysis that we did, because again, we had a large sample size, that the two independently associated factors with medical errors, self-reported, were a positive depression screen or burnout, and not, after you accounted for that, uh, workload, overnight call, practice setting, or compensation. And just to give you an example, here, this is emotional exhaustion, one of the uh, domains of uh, burnout. And you can see, in terms of percentage medical errors on the top, there we go, there is a threefold increase ranging from low levels of emotional exhaustion to high, correlating an association with burnout. And then in our publication, it, these were the independent features associated with burnout, and we've gone through each of these individually and studied them in more detail because we had such a large sample size. And I'll show you some of the results in, in a minute. Now, practice satisfaction is important not only for retention of a surgeon in their practice, but also associated with quality of care. 
And in our analysis, the most important feature associated with practice satisfaction and career choice is an absence of burnout. We've uh, also published about workload, and as you can see, again, correlating percentage of burnout with hours worked, that those who work, uh, and this is self-reported, 80 hours or more a week, had a burnout rate of 50%. And also, those who had nights on call two or more times a week also had an elevated um, incidence of burnout. We stated in our paper that this does not mean we should start restricting hours. Burnout itself and the reasons behind them are too multifactorial and it would be too simplistic to just say, well, we can reduce the incidence by limiting hours of physicians. That might actually be a stressor itself. We also drilled down because we had, again had so many patients and did a separate analysis within the 14 surgical specialties. And also we had enough data we could compare those in an academic setting and those in a private practice. And again, while the average was 40%, you could see there was a range from a low of pediatric surgeons of one third, that's still a big number, to a high in trauma of 51% of trauma surgeons were experiencing burnout at the time of the survey, including the second survey. And I'm not going to show the data on internal medicine, but exactly the same was found in internal medicines who were critical care doctors, and pediatricians were at the bottom of the list. But you can see there's a big spread, and this is statistically significant. If we also looked at screen positive for depression, it's a little bit different rank order because these are independent uh, issues. And as you can see, there's a range from 20% here to 37%. So the point here is that while we all may be at risk because of the physician selection in a specialty, because of the nature of the patients that we take care of, we are at relatively greater risk among some specialties than others, and that has been validated as an independent feature. Now, another thing that we studied that we actually had a hard time with because people did not uh, believe the data, but it's been validated twice, and everything I'm going to tell you has also been validated exactly the same for women in internal medicine, that women surgeons di differed from their male colleagues in every demographic variable, even though their workload was the same. But among married surgeons, nearly twice as many women had a spouse or partner that worked outside of the home. And in fact, we wrote a separate paper on 333 surgeons who were married to a surgeon. And that, of course, is a, uh, that combination is a stressor itself. We found that women, because they're coming into the workforce in the past few decades, uh, more than in the past, were younger, less likely to be married, but importantly, were more likely than men to have burnout. And this was uh, not only statistically significant, but an independent feature. And as we drilled down into this, we found that one of the major contributing causes was work-home conflict, for which we've written four or five papers about this. And we found that work-home conflicts were a major contributor to burnout and, not surprisingly, were more common among women surgeons, especially those who are married with a spouse who is a health care provider, and especially if they had children between the ages of 5 and 21. And probably the women in this audience would tell you they can relate to that. That doesn't mean we know all of the causes, but certainly that's one. And in a multivariate analysis again, and these are highly significant numbers, causes of burnout were associated with experiencing a work-home conflict in the last three weeks, and in those who said that they did, then we ask them whether it was resolved in favor of work or at home or both. Now, the right answer is it should be resolved for both. But as you could see, that burnout was associated when the work-home conflict was resolved in favor of work. Another question, and again, probably the women in the audience will relate to this, so if you think about who is the primary provider if you're both working for a sick child or a child out of school or when the nanny or the uh, person taking care of the kids calls in that morning and you're about to go to the hospital, 
and they say, I can't come into work today, and your kids need to go to school. 25% of women relied on their spouse, whereas compared to 70% for men. Women surgeons were more likely to feel that child rearing had slowed their career advancement, experienced a conflict with their spouse's or partner's career, and had experienced a work-home conflict in the last three weeks. Now, one other issue that we studied, and this is a very delicate subject, um, and we asked Mick Oroskovics, who I told you was the um, member of the College of Surgeons, the trauma surgeon who became a psychiatrist, who is a national expert on physician addiction, both drugs and alcohol. And we asked him to, one, help us with the survey questions so that they were the same as alcohol researchers use um, nationally, so these are validated survey instruments. And in addition, we ratcheted down the criteria for alcohol abuse or misuse by one drink per month in order to be conservative in the definitions that we were using. So this is the paper that we published in the um, our, uh, JAMA surgery with uh, Mick Roscovich as a former alcoholic. This was his his personal story, and he talks about it, and is one of the leading specialists in physician addiction behavior. So what we found among in this, and I should tell you that in the first survey we had these questions in, but the American College of Surgeons didn't want us to ask because they didn't know what to do with the data. The second time around they were more comfortable with asking because uh, this wasn't the first thing out, and so this was uh, a result of our second uh, survey where we had seven, over 7,000 surgeons responding. 34% of the responding surgeons had an audit C score compatible with problematic alcohol consumption, and an additional 15% had an audit C score consistent with alcohol abuse or dependence. Now this is a validated survey uh, instrument that's shown here. And what was actually the most significant part of this that again we uh, had to validate the point prevalence for alcohol abuse or dependence using conservative criteria for male surgeons was 13.8% for women surgeons was almost double that at 25%. And those factors associated with symptoms of alcohol abuse or misuse where a report of a major medical error in the, in the previous uh, three months was more common and constituted 78% of the surgeons reporting a major medical error. Surgeons with alcohol abuse or dependence were more likely to be burned out. And again, this is probably a two-way association and in a multivariate analysis, male gender, we had to figure out a politically correct way to say this. I would have said it more directly. But male gender was associated with a lower likelihood of alcohol abuse or dependency. Now, again, I don't want you to think this is unique to surgeons or even especially women surgeons. Here are the results. This is the only one I put in from the survey done through the American Medical Association with an equally large sample size of internists. And again, Mick Oroskovich was the lead in this. So among American physicians, again, 7,200 responded. The overall rate sorry, of alcohol abuse or dependency was 15%. Substance abuse uh, for surgeons and internists was almost exclusively alcohol. And it was most prevalent among women compared to men younger age, those who were burned out and depressed. So it was essentially the, exactly the same results that we found with surgeons. I also put in this as what I think is another contributor or association with burnout. This again is a uh, study recently published in the British Medical Journal, and I'll just read you the conclusion. Among 48,800 physicians, divorce was prevalent. Um, and they compared different specialties, but it was more prevalent with a hazard ratio of 1.5 among women. And when stratified by gender, greater uh, workload was associated with divorce prevalence only for women uh, physicians. Now, as I've given this talk around the country and indeed around the world, those in the audience thought 
our results aren't like that. We have happy surgeons. I gave this talk at Memorial Sloan Kettering and didn't know that in the audience was the chief of psychiatry and the chief of physician employment who set out with a hypothesis that our surgical faculty is happier than this. It can't be like that. And what they found is their incidence was the same. We'd actually done a study as well at Johns Hopkins, which we didn't publish, but Julie Freischleg allowed me to put in this editorial. Their incidence was 42%. At Johns Hopkins, it was 38%. Remember, the average nationally was 40%. And what they found, which was opposite to their hypothesis, that their data showed that burnout and its associated problems are truly widespread occupational hazards that deserve a systematic organizational intervention. And among the 72 surgeons who responded, 42% reported burnout, 27% some psychiatric levels of distress, and so forth. So I won't go into that, but these papers here are really nice papers from a single institution, a two-part series that I would commend all of you to read in the Annals of Surgical Oncology and the editorial that I wrote with Tate Shanafeld, who's the Mayo Clinic lead in this, on this dynamic tension between success in a surgical career and personal wellness. And I think many of you would relate to this next part that we wrote. How can we succeed in a stressful environment and a culture of bravado? So what do we do about this? In the last few minutes, this is a tough subject because the causes of burnout are so multifactorial, and we as individuals have so many different reasons why we may at some point in our career experience burnout. And so, just like cancer, where the causes are multiples, the treatments are many, the, this has to be an individual issue between one, all of us taking personal responsibilities for our personal wellness, and for those who are responsible for the workplace environment in which we work, to be aware and to be uh, proactive. But I asked Tate Shanafel to write what is, I think, a very nice article on a five-step process. This, especially for younger people, gives a structure around which they can look at uh, a systematic way of doing strategic planning, self-assessment, and reviewing things with either family or a personal mentor. And uh, so I won't go into the details in the interest of time, so I did want to point out what he had said, and this is a really important approach. While identifying personal values and protecting personal time is necessary to achieve work-life balance, time away from work must be more than simply a chance to rest for another day. So caring for self, cultivating relationships, nurturing personal interests outside of medicine is what makes time away from work meaningful and provides individuals the opportunity for personal achievement and growth outside of work. And these were just some examples in his article as a checklist that people can go over on various domains of personal wellness. So one of the last papers we've written in surgery, we have one more that we're writing on young academic surgeons. Um, this was on avoiding burnout and the personal health habits and wellness practices of U.S. surgeons. You should read this. It wouldn't surprise you to, to find that we, as surgeons, don't do the very things that we tell our patients to do. We don't follow the CDC rules for prevention and screening based upon age, gender, and background. But I'll just list us some two summaries of this, of the top ten differences among surgeons not burned out and those who were. And as you look at this list, which I won't read, there's no surprises here. This is all common sense stuff. This is the things that we tell ourselves that we'd like to do. This is what we tell our patients, our family members, our friends that they should do as part of good health. But somehow, in our mind, some more than others, we feel like we are too busy or maybe too important, and put off our personal needs uh, at the expense of our career. For example, in the memorial survey, and uh, this has been repeated a number of times, 78% of the responding surgeons did not take their vacation. 
And those of you who get Time Magazine, there was an article this week that this is a national uh, issue that people don't take their full vacation or don't take a vacation at all. So then looking at the flip side of that, those factors independently associated with a high quality of life, again, this is the very things that you would expect. Notice, take vacations, CDC compliant with exercise guidelines, recreations, hobbies, and exercise. These are all things I could say for me personally and many people who I've talked to or counseled. These are the, the straightforward things that we all know we have to do but somehow don't find the time. And if we don't, we can insidiously slip into a risk for burnout. So why is quality of life as one of these things we measure important to the surgical profession? First, it correlates with better patient care. Less reported uh, self-reported medical errors, less self-reported depression and suicide ideation, lower rates of self-reported alcohol abuse or misuse, correlation in America where we have more malpractice, a lower probability of malpractice, greater career satisfaction, lower work-home conflict, and a lower rate of leaving a surgical practice prematurely. So one other uh, issue that I think is straightforward for each of us, certainly in my career, when I had my burnout experience, I got through that because of people that I'd chosen ahead of time as mentors, my big brothers, that I could talk to and that would help me uh, work through this. So mentoring, and in this article, a more formal thing of coaching, is very strongly correlated with reduction in burnout. And I just wanted to read to you what is coaching in this article, but is really part of mentoring. So I would also submit that everyone in this room, especially the younger people, should have a mentor, and everybody in this room should be a mentor for somebody else that's coming along in their career behind us. So coaching or mentoring enhances self-awareness, draws on individual strengths, questions self-defeating thoughts and belief. Remember, if we're all be perfect people, it's how do we handle our mistakes and our imperfections and aligning personal values with our professional duties. Coaching presumes that the client already possesses the strength and skills to handle life challenges, but at least at that time and in their life, they're not accessing them maxfully. So coaching and mentoring should increase one's sense of accomplishment, purpose, and engagement, all critical in ameliorating burnout. So here are my conclusions. I hope for this that it will at least uh, spark some debate and dis discussion. I hope for those who, for whatever reason, may be experiencing that or know colleagues that they are, that it's not shameful to talk about it because so many people are experiencing it. It is better to address it directly than this culture of bravado where we somehow try to hide it and bury it. We, uh, I hope, will encourage physicians to be more proactive in their personal health habits in whatever is appropriate for each of us, and importantly, to encourage more research in this area, including here in Israel. So these results, I think, have around the world, as we've published more and more, and others have published papers, should stimulate a heightened call for personal wellness and a supportive workplace environment for all physicians because being proactive is much better than reacting to the circumstances, such as those I told you about in the beginning, that can spiral into a crisis that damages one's professional life or personal wellness and may take months or years to repair. So in summary, these are some of the issues that in combinations put, uh, put each of us on a relative risk scale Certainly, you know, I do breast cancer. So if I have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 breast patient with a family history of breast cancer, I'm going to be much more proactive of screen one prevention studies or screening in order to detect the disease at an earlier stage so that they don't die of the breast cancer or require radical treatment. And so, too, among all of us that may be at risk, some are at more risk than others, and in that group... Uh, we should be especially proactive. So preventing stress and burnout is a responsibility of all of us as physicians. 
and physicians should be guided. And there are studies I could show you on medical students, residents, those who are assistant professors, those who go into uh, private practice. The sources of stress are different, and they're different at each of our seasons of life, but the common manifestations of those can be a burnout experience. So here's my take-home messages. There is no single formula for achieving a satisfying professional career that can be applied in such a diverse set of surgical practice environment, and each surgeon must continuously map their own career pathway that integrates their personal and professional goals with the outcome of maintaining value balance, that elusive balance between work and home, that while we may never achieve it, certainly I haven't achieved it, my kids call me a recovering workaholic even at my age, that if we don't strive for it, we can tilt insidiously into being a workaholic. And having mentors and being a mentor is important. So here's my last slide. John Cameron, when he was president of the American College of Surgeons, I think made a very nice statement about the love of our job as a profession. And he said, if you pick a profession you love, you will never have to work a day in your life. The flip side of that is a quote from one of my friends, Ken Boa, who says, one key to stress management is a realistic satisfaction in work while avoiding the pitfall of turning it into an idol. And for me, especially for young people, Josie Klausner gave him a very nice introduction of me, but you and I both know people who at the end of their career had nothing other than their career. They had no personal life, they'd lost their family, they had no hobbies, they may not have been in good health. So for me, a successful surgical career at the expense of one's personal well-being, however you define that for yourself, is not at all successful. So thank you for the opportunity of coming for this uh, hopefully stimulating talk, uh, and I really enjoyed the opportunity, in fact, the honor of being before the Israeli Surgical Society and being introduced by my dear friend, Josie Klausner. Thank you.